to welcome our uh, esteemed guests on your behalf, Dr. Ingrid Matson. I will introduce her in a few minutes, and Sheikh Faraz Rabbani. You see him, alhamdulillah, every other month he gives khutbah here. He is regular. He has spoken many times here. And inshallah, today, as you saw, and he was advertised, we talk about the Canadian Muslims' response to violent extremism and Islamophobia. Before we start, inshallah, we read a few verses from the Holy Quran. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim أقم الصلاة لدلوك الشمس إلى غسق الليل وقرآن الفجر إن قرآن الفجر كان مشهودا أقم الصلاة لدلوك الشمس إلى غسق الليل وقرآن الفجر إن قرآن الفجر كان مشهودا وقل رب أدخلني مدخل صدق وأخرجني مخرج صدق واجعل لي من لدنك سلطانا نصيرا وقل جاء الحق وزهق الباطل إن الباطل كان زهوقا صدق الله العظيم وصدق رسوله الكريم عليه أفضل الصلاة والتسليم وعلى ونحن على ذلك من الشاهدين الحمد لله to address this topic, which is a huge topic, is the topic of the hour. We invited and we're very honored to have a scholar, a sister, uh, a professor, an academic person, Dr. Ingrid Matson. She was born in Kingston. She's a, a Muslim religious leader, professor of Islamic studies, and a very known and interfaith activist. She's currently the London London, Ontario, of course, and Windsor Community Chair in Islamic Studies at Huron University College at the University of Western Ontario in London, Ontario, Canada. Matson is former president of the Islamic Society of North America, ISNA, and was described as perhaps the most noticed figure among American, North American Muslim women in a 2010 New York Times article. Uh, we can say a lot. This is a, a, a her actually biography probably will take up all the time. So if I miss anything that is critical, uh, Dr. Ingrid, but she has done a wonderful job with uh, Hartford Seminary for over 13 years, 13 years which is the first accredited uh, theological seminary for Muslims to graduate. Quite a few imams actually are her students in America and some of them here in Canada, alhamdulillah. And she has impacted a lot of them. And actually tomorrow, tomorrow she's here for the Canadian Center for Deen Studies for our uh, many imams and many students of CCDS who will be actually attending her training workshop on khutbah and lecture and, and so on and so forth. So alhamdulillah, without further ado, Dr. Ingrid Matson. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in uh, Brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Wa alaikum as-salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh 
Uh, I'm honored to be uh, invited here to speak to you tonight in this very beautiful place, mashallah. It is um, really such a testament to this community that you've come together to build such a beautiful place in this land. May Allah bless you, bless your leadership and all those who have contributed to making this a community that is righteous and lives in obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first thing I want to say is that I believe that, that the foremost response of Canadian Muslims and American Muslims to violent extremism up to now has been laudable, has been praiseworthy, and I'm very proud of our community, mashallah. One of the things I noticed immediately after 9-11, and I, I uh, just moved back to Canada two years ago after living in the United States since 1989, what I noticed within a very short time after 9-11, when we were faced with two very disturbing forms of discourse. On the one hand, there were Muslims who were appearing again and again with increasing frequency on television and media, claiming that they were acting in the name of Islam, claiming that they were acting in the name of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, claiming that they were uh, uh, ju justified in their actions by the Qur'an and they were doing the most horrible, reprehensible things. Very disturbing. At the same time, mirroring this and paralleling this were those who were taking advantage of these horrible events, people who were already predisposed negatively towards Muslims, who had a, a political or religious ideological bias against Muslims and agenda against Muslims, and those people who then said, yes, what these extremists, what these militants are saying is Islam, and this is why Islam is bad. Uh, and this is why we have to keep Muslims out of the public sphere. This is why we have to marginalize Islam. This is why we have to get rid of Islam. Or many of them, interestingly, many of them who were atheists saw Islam by, by, by attacking Islam was an opportunity for them actually to attack religion in general. So their main goal was attacking religion. And whichever religion, you know, religious figure or institution was in the news that, that was having problems or that's what they would attack to say, see, this is the problem with religion. And we know those people who, uh, who went on and did these kind of things. So these two discourses, which remarkably mirrored each other in both of them saying Islam is this violent extremist crazy thing. Some of them saying it is and that's, you know, we're justified in doing these actions. And the other one saying this is why we should get rid of Muslims. So both extremist discourse and Islamophobia coming together. What I saw, the response in our community was remarkable. Ordinary Muslims who said enough is enough. You know, most people just want to live their life. Most people want to live peacefully. They don't want to have trouble. They're very busy with trying to make a living, trying to take care of their family, feed their family nutritious food, keep people healthy, keep relationships. In ordinary circumstances, the vast majority of people don't get involved in public debates, public discourse. They may do some civic work, some civic engagement, you know, once a month go serve in the soup kitchen or something like this, but they, you know, they're just ordinary people. And most Muslims are like that. But in the wake of these two very hostile, negative, destructive discourses, I saw in every community ordinary Muslims saying, I need to do something about this. Uh, many of those, uh, I saw many of them come uh, to study Islam. I personally had students who came from California. If you know the difference between California and Connecticut, Connecticut's by, you know, between Boston and New York. Canadians know more about American geography than Americans know about Canadian geography, so I probably don't have to tell you that. Uh, I, had, I had students who came from Florida, from Tennessee, from Iowa. And each of the, in each of these cases, these were what you would call housewives. These were uh, middle-aged uh, Muslim women who never thought of themselves uh, as, as people who could speak about Islam. 
but they were so appalled by what they saw. They were so outraged by what was being said about their own precious religion, their faith, their holy book, concerned about the impact on their families, on their children, on their community, that they undertook great efforts to educate themselves. And, and others went and signed up for other programs. I'm sure Sheikh Faraz has many of these people who have signed up for his wonderful programs um, that can be accessed online as well. Uh, in every community, we saw the interest in learning about a religion more and more on a deeper level. So we know what is right and wrong so that we can answer these very uh, uh, sometimes sophisticated attacks on our religion. And I saw people take um, public speaking training. And they went and they learned how to do public speaking. They learned how to create a PowerPoint. They uh, went out and spoke in churches and synagogues and civic organizations. They went to their kids' schools. They went to libraries. Uh, they, even if they were normally a little bit shy, they reached out to their neighbors. They started engaging in social justice work, in interfaith work, um, finding out who were people in the community who were doing good and saying, I want to do good with you because this is what my religion teaches me. What a real Muslim is is a Muslim who cares about his or her neighbors, who cannot sleep when her neighbor is, is hungry. This is what a real Muslim is. And all over the place, Muslims have done this. MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. There is so much khair in our community. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, maybe you hate a thing and it's good for you. Yes, there's so many hateful things that have happened. But our response to it has been good, mashallah. We have become stronger. We have become more knowledgeable. We have become more engaged. It does not mean that it's easier. Struggle is difficult. Uh, we don't like it. We don't want it. We get tired. And that means that we need to support each other. We need to pace ourselves. We need to make sure that we balance this work with all of the things that are around us. But there is a lot of good that has been done, mashallah. And that is all over the world. Alhamdulillah, I'm very blessed with being able to travel and meet Muslims all over this country, all over the United States, in Europe, in other parts of the world, and you see the same thing. You see the vast majority of Muslims are increasing in their awareness and in their commitment to stand up for true Islam, uh, the Islam that we know that is about justice and peace and love and harmony and, and respecting uh, people. If this is the case, however, if I see this and I notice this, and I am absolutely convinced that this is the truth. Why is it the case that when I talk to many Muslim young people, their vision of the world right now is completely doom and gloom? Very, very negative. Uh, I had a, a group of, of students, of university students, who asked me to come speak to them because they were feeling overwhelmed by the situation, they were feeling overwhelmed by, they said, they said there's, so much, there's so many negative images of Muslims in the news right now, and you know, why are we always being criticized, and why is Islam always being singled out? This is what they were saying to me. So, uh, so I asked them, I said, um, the one person who said, there's so much negativity and, and bad news about Muslims. Why is the media always so bad towards Muslims? I said to her, what news are you watching? She said, oh, I don't watch the news. I said, uh, well, what newspapers are you reading? She said, um, I don't read any newspapers. I said, are you listening to the radio? No, not really. So I said, then, where are you getting your news from? You said that the media is this way. Where are you getting all this news? Well, it turns out, she told me, and then the other students told me the same thing. Almost all of them, except for one out of maybe 20, they all said they get their news on their Facebook page. And the way they get the so-called news is their friends will post items on their Facebook page, 
or they uh, subscribe to uh, a Twitter, Twitter feed or something else that directs news to them, but only news about Islamophobic incidents, hate crimes against Muslims, civil rights violations against Muslims. So I've, I've had, uh, they get things like, I asked them what kind of things did you showed up in your, in your uh, Facebook lately, they said, well, did you hear about that Muslim woman in Paris who someone pulled off her hijab? I said, interesting, <laughs> this, this news that you've gotten. And then other incidents like that, oh, there was a mosque in, in this, uh, some state in the United States that had uh, vandalism. So I, I said to them, you know, part of the, the issue here, part of the problem is that you're not listening to the news. You are only a, a, a kind of filter for bad news. If you tell me that there was a, an act of arson against a mosque in the United States, I want to tell you that in uh, 10 years, the number of mosques in the United States increased by 800. 800 new mosques were built in a decade after 9-11. Why is that not your news? You tell me about one woman whose hijab was pulled off, can you tell me how many women whose hijabs were not pulled off, who walked around with their hijab on? Uh, we are constantly being fed and actually looking for the bad news. It is not to say it does not exist, it is not to say that these things don't happen, but it's completely distorting our, our perception in precisely the same way that the perception of the average Canadian about what Muslims do is distorted because of the news they get. So the, the news is about what's violent, what's alarming, what's disturbing, uh, if it bleeds, it leads. This is the, this is the nature of, of, of news. Now that's different if you watch uh, uh, magazines or comment magazines, you get something else, you listen to CBC, they have these long essays and research and, and documentaries about different issues, but I'm saying the headlines, you know, at the top of the hour, what's happening right now. Um, and, and, and so those are the disturbing things that come in the news. So people's views are distorted and shaped by that. The, the amount of disturbing news has increased because there is, there, we have had a number of series of wars where Muslims have been involved or Muslim countries. So Muslims are being fed and or people generally, Canadians are being fed this kind of bad news. It has changed their perceptions. We say, well, why don't they put anything about, you know, ordinary Muslim family goes out for dinner and uh, takes their kids tobogganing. Well, we know that that's news. We know that that's not news. So how do people understand that information? How do they get that information? How do they balance? How do they filter what they see on the news, which is negative and upsetting? And, and, and instead of saying, well, that's what Islam and Muslims are about, rather than putting it in the Islam and Muslim category, they put it in the criminality category. They put it along the same category as top of the news about some gang that did this, or some criminal who did this, or some murder. That's where that belongs in their mental ca ca um, categories, in their cognitive frames. The reason, the only reason someone would put in the Muslim framework is that they don't know enough Muslims. And study after study after study has shown that, um, that when non-Muslims have relationships with Muslims, that they will um, understand that these activities, that this violence is not mainstream Islam. They will understand that this is criminality rather than what Islam teaches. How is that gonna happen? The only way that, that happens is with outreach. The only way that happens is with actually having a relationship with someone. Not, what is a relationship? It's where you know them and they know you, where you care about them, where they care about you, where you understand some of their hopes and dreams and they do as well. 
we need to have these relationships to ameliorate what will continue to happen, which is that news will always continue to give news. And it is also the case that cognitively, we retain negative and scary information far longer than positive information. Think about when you were a kid. I bet everyone can remember a nightmare that they had. But how many dreams can we remember? We, this is, we, we are, in, for survival, we are alerted to remember things that are scary. What is a threat? So those things will stick in our mind. Whether we feel as Muslims unsafe because people are, 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 there are people who say bad things about Muslims or hate Muslims or Islamophobia, or whether it's a non-Muslim Canadian who hears about the, these stories about these crazy Muslims who are saying these things and they feel uh, that they're under threat. Terrorism has worked to this extent that we're all feeling terrorized. We're all feeling a little terrorized right now, or at least a little bit afraid. So how do we make sure that it doesn't work? How do we stop that from those people from succeeding? It is to have a better understanding of reality. There was a great uh, uh, news item on CBC yesterday. Um, it was very interesting. There was a photographer and he was out on the ocean and he, he saw a, a, another boat and there was a man who was sitting on the boat with his um, with his Blackberry or his phone and he was looking and he was texting and right behind him, immediately behind him, like two, three feet behind him, a huge humpback whale came out of the water, right behind him. And he was so busy texting that he didn't notice it. And so the, the man who was looking the other way took a picture of this and actually videotaped this. Unbelievable, you know, there, there's this beautiful, majestic, amazing thing. Not only did he not see it, he didn't hear, think of all the sound that it would have made and the water and the smell of the, of the water droplets that would have come. He's completely oblivious to his surroundings because of looking on this. And sometimes I feel this is how we are. Honestly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us. I, in, in my day, as I go throughout my day, I have dozens and dozens of encounters with people in my neighborhood, uh, in my uh, place of work, in the gas station, who are nice, who are friendly, who are kind, who are eager to be, to show that they're nice. Uh, I put that in the balance with the negativity. The reality of where I live, the reality of the people that I live with, and I know that you are having the same experience too. Yes, you're having some, neg some, posit some negative experiences, but how do they weigh out against the positive? Let's not be so distracted by this stream of very selective, cherry-picked negative news that we are ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the good that we have and ungrateful to the people who we live with who are kind to us and are nice and want to help us build a society that is peaceful, that is loving, and that can be exemplary. And in the end, this is the best thing we can do. There's very little we can do sometimes. You know, some people say, and I'll close with this, they say, you know, how can we, or how can a Muslim just stand there and not do anything when they see Muslims in the world suffering? How can you do that? The answer is sometimes you can't do anything to stop people from being harmed. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who is our example, had to stand and watch two beloved companions who were, who were among the earliest Muslims, the earliest people who received his message, Sumaya and Yasir, may Allah be pleased with them. He had to stand there and watch them be tortured what is it like to watch someone be tortured and be killed in, in the most brutal and degrading way? And he, alayhi sallam, he could only stand and say, paradise, family of Yasir, or patience, O family of Yasir, verily paradise is yours. SubhanAllah. Because there are limits that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set. And in that time, it was not allowed for the Prophet Muhammad SSM to use, he had, no, he had no authority to use any force to, to intervene, to even rush and say, stop it. 
He had no authority in that city. Yet he prayed. Do we say it's only a prayer? Do we think so little of prayer? Do we think so little of faith? Do we think so little of the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which in the end, there, there is no power except through Allah. We think so little of it that we think that, that praying for the suffering people is nothing. No, it's the greatest thing. It's the most important thing. If we spent as much time praying for those suffering people as we did watching news of them, I think there would be a change in the world. So we do that. We do something. And there are other things that we can't do. But we start with that prayer and then we look in gratitude to the many, many opportunities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has presented to us to live the way that a Muslim should within the limits that Allah has set. And live that generous life and that life full of compassion and mercy for other people and that is the best thing we can do, and it is not something small. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> Rabbil